I mean, that's <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> And human beings make great music. <laughs> and the minute you start sticking technology in front of them and between them, you're basically screwing up their ability to communicate with each other. I mean, I've never understood why the hell anybody wants to sound like a Les Paul record. <laughs> Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's Lid Shaw, your host for Recording Studio Rockstars. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is a very special guest. It's Bob Olson, a master audio engineer and producer with 50 years of experience. Bob has a truly remarkable career path that has led him from Detroit to San Francisco to space and finally back to Nashville. He was one of only two people to ever hold every engineering position at Motown Records. That's awesome. In Detroit, during which he recorded and mastered 100 top 10 singles, 42 of which were number one hits. He even recorded Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Stevie Wonder, and Motown's first successful rock act, Rare Earth. Then in San Francisco, he mixed dozens of live jazz, folk, and classical broadcasts from Van Halen to Weather Report at KPFA Radio and built a 24-track recording studio that he managed for over a decade which led to him co-producing the band's final album for Capitol Records. And listeners using any DAW might enjoy this. Bob also built the first Pro Tools motion picture post audio system in Northern California, and while working as an editor at AW Audio, did all of his mixing at Skywalker Ranch. Ever heard of the movie Star Wars? His freelancing credits in San Francisco included The Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia Band, Graham Nash, Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Percy Mayfield, Ron Thompson, Harmonia Mundi Records, and many others. He also worked with Hearts of Space Records. He mastered their catalog of ambient, electronic, and world music. A number of these titles were acclaimed as audiophile reference recordings. I totally remember loving to hear those recordings on public radio during late night drives across the country growing up. Finally, Bob's career led him to Nashville, where he continues to engineer and master records, working with clients like Keb Mo, Funk Brothers, Ray Manzarek, Ray Wiley Hubbard, Ian McLaughlin, The Blind Boys of Alabama, Beth Nielsen Chapman, Freedy Johnson, BR549, Old Crow Medicine Show, Susie Boggess, Betty Levette, and many others. Whew. All right. I think you may have passed the moniker of rock star long ago, Bob, <laughs> and probably moved on to something more like demigod. But thank you so much for joining us here on Recording Studio Rockstars. Mr. Bob Olson, are you ready to rock? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. The, the studio I built was for Quicksilver Messenger Service. Okay. Well, you want to tell us more about that, or would you like to tell us just more about who you are after my lengthy introduction there? Oh, God. Where to begin? You you started this well, where at I, a young age, right? Yeah, where I began was in the sixth grade. My sixth grade class, for some reason or other, was doing a radio special that we wrote and performed. And when we went over to the high school to do the broadcast, I took one look at the control room and becoming a railroad engineer went right out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and from that time on, I was at the library reading everything I could find out about radio and broadcasting and, and audio equipment, wow. which, I mean, there were only really a handful of books at that time. So it, it, there was not a lot of information, but it was from very good sources. And I took radio drama from the eighth grade until I graduated and that was amazing because the junior high teacher and the senior high teacher had both been producers at NBC, and they were both women, and they had both been fired 
when the men came back from World War II. Radio drama. <laughs> did you guys really have like tabletops with shoes so you can do pretend walking, or did you the did you really bit. have half coconuts for all of for that. horse hoofs and all that? All of that. What was the best mic that you used to use for recording a half coconut? Uh, well, we used RCA 44s for everything. Of course. Who wouldn't need a, an RCA 44 to record a half coconut? <laughs> I mean, that was the standard. That had been the standard mic since the late 20s. <laughs> That's incredible. Now one of those mics might go for $3,000, anywhere from two to $4,000, I think, too. Yeah, which is totally bizarre. But Well, first off, I, for context, prior to... The early 1950s, a major label recording studio used four mics. You know, a selection of 44s and 77s, but four inputs on the console. Right. And And so that would be thought of as four different performers. Well, basically, you had like an overall pickup and spot mics. Okay. So you would typically, with a big band, have an overall pickup or maybe possibly one for brass and one for saxes. So now when you say pickup, somebody today might, was probably thinking about that little white plastic thing in the head of their guitar, their electric guitar. That's not the kind of pickup we're talking about. No. <laughs> we're talking about um, you know using a big mic, sensitive mic on the floor that, that hears the entire orchestra and band. Yeah. And then one for the soloist, I mean, possibly splitting the horns, but one for the soloist, definitely, and one for the rhythm section. And that was placed between the piano and the drums and the bass. So let's, let's, let's spell this out a little bit more. So a pickup mic would be an Omni, or are all these mics figure eight? Because these were almost all figure eights. Okay, so you'd have a big mic like a RCA 44, in a figure eight pattern, and the front is pointed sort of towards the middle of the towards orchestra. The middle of the orchestra. And, and the back is pointed towards anything? Towards the wall. Just towards the wall. All right. And then where would you position the soloist? The soloist would be either on a 44 or a 77, and they would be in front. It would be set up much like on stage. Okay, so it looked similar to how they would. Would look very perform. similar to how how they were used to performing. And the rhythm section, typically in a big band situation, is off to the left or something like yeah. that, right? They're off yeah. to one side. Yeah, and that that would be bass, piano, drums, and sometimes guitar. Um, what about things like phasing issues when you're doing this? Did did, did they exist for something? Oh like yeah, that? they were very careful about it. What would be some thoughts that you would have to consider? Well, the well the main thing is that a figure eight. There's nothing deader than the side of a figure eight. <laughs> and yeah. so it actually gave them real good control as long as they were careful to not have two things out of phase with each other. So if the big figure eight is rejecting the the left and the right side of the stage, do you try and have the rhythm section in that rejection zone uh, or the soloist in the totally, rejection zone? Not totally. A soloist would be somewhat under it. And they would have their own mic. I mean, it was basically something that would work acoustically, and the soloist mic and the rhythm section mic was just sort of to add some detail in, to fill yeah. it in. I mean, the, the main mic was the— uh, Was everything. Was the, the everything. And that, I mean, I mean, because I mean, their whole notion was we are recording music. Yeah. They are making music here. We are recording it. What a trip. Now, this is um, <laughs> what would be an example of a sound that we might, that everybody might be familiar with that would have been recorded that way? We're talking like the, the Glenn Miller Orchestra? The Glenn or? Miller Orchestra, Duke Ellington, any of them. What about uh, old Andrew's sister's recordings? Same thing. Really? No kidding with those three part harmonies and everything? Yeah. Was that the three of them just singing into that one spot mic? Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. That's mind blowing. Yeah. Oh, but uh, I mean, at Motown, I was generally recording backgrounds into one mic. Okay. Because we found it sounded a lot better. Well, let's jump forward a little bit. So <laughs> you you went from, okay. what was it, fifth grade, sixth grade? So, you decided yeah, not yeah. to be a train engineer, and, and next thing you know, you're at Motown. I'm right? going to be a recording engineer, and then I took radio drama, which gave me an incredible insight into 
broadcasting, broadcast stations, advertising. You seem like a kind of a dramatic guy, Bob. And so I was able, I was able, I mean, the, the cool thing about being at Motown is I understood everything that was going on with the promotion, the whole ball of wax. Yeah, because it was such a small company, you could see all the elements. Or it was so a small many. enough company, and it was like I understood the logic of it. Yeah, I understood the logic behind it, and and Barry Gordy is the most skilled problem solver I've encountered in my life. Because he, I mean, he had never worked for a record label. He'd worked as a producer doing stuff, but that was strictly in the studio. But l- label wise. And he he originally the company was originally a management company. It wasn't it wasn't a label until they got a hundred dollar check from United Artists that they framed and put on the wall because wow. it was so pathetic. The original for a number one single. The original hundred dollar <laughs> startup right there. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So and so so I mean you know so he didn't know anything about. He basically learned on the job how to run a record label. And frankly, I think he ran it more brilliantly than the majors I dealt with after I left. Yeah. So, Bob, let's pause for just one sec. Let's be fair and realistic that there are people who may be listening to this that are just not familiar with Motown. They may not even know much about it. Can you... How do you explain what Motown was to somebody who didn't know about it yet? Well, Motown was the first really successful black-owned record company, management company in the world. I mean, the two most successful independent labels ever were Motown and A&M. And Motown... And A&M was... Was that owned by uh, Herb, Herb Alpert? Herb Alpert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what Herb Alpert jumped on that blindsided everybody including us, was that you could sell albums if you had a nice cover. Yeah. <laughs> Whipped cream and other delights. I had that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, the, the hi-fi industry had come out with bookshelf stereo speakers that would fit in a college dorm room. And A&M figured out that you could sell albums Actually, the company before them that figured that out was Verve selling jazz albums where they were doing 10, 20-minute songs that could never be singles. And the uh, president of Verve got snapped up by Frank Sinatra for reprise because he was doing the hippest records. So Sinatra wanted the hippest. So I'm glad you, you mentioned Frank Sinatra. Would his records have been recorded in that same kind of fashion with the the one mic the early and ones. he was on the on the stage with everybody? Anything before three track. I mean, we had three track at Motown, and we were we had invented punching in, and God, we created most of the stuff I can you rail t- against today. Can you tell <laughs> us about the invention of punching in? What does that mean? Yeah, well, punching into a track, or English call it dropping in. Right, so now and, we're familiar with that in a Pro Tools or something because you just go into record yeah, while you're playing. Yeah, but on an analog machine, I mean, we couldn't punch out. We had you had to like pull the head gate down to avoid a loud pop on a punch out. Wow! So that was pretty exciting. Luckily, I didn't get in the studio. I was in mastering. I didn't get in the studio until we had a sixteen track. Okay, but, <laughs> but uh, oh god, what those guys did is. Amazing. But anyway. What were some of the other things that you guys invented there? I, I had some great quotes where you were talking about uh, time at Motown. Well, you, it was the only pl- it was the first place I know of that had multiple sends from the console. And what would you use those multiple sends for? Uh three different kinds of echo. We called it echo. It was never called reverb until Lexicon came out. Nobody, really? Yeah, nobody that was a that was a lexiconism. They no. made up the word reverb as well, or was, did that no, word No, no, it was short for reverberation, right, which okay. was a technical right, term right. from, I guess, so, architecture. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> but anyway, yeah, everybody called it echo, and they were called echo sends. And we had two, well, they originally had, I believe, two live chambers and an EMT plate, 
and a rack mount Echoplex and a rack mount Fender Spring Reverb and an Echolette, which is a kind of a bizarre European thing. So Tape Echo, new listeners might be familiar with plugins for Echo, and they might have some plugins that say that they're Tape Echoes. The reason a Tape Echo even existed was because you could record onto the tape, and then it took a moment for the tape to get from the record head over to the playhead and play it back. Yeah. Right? That was sort of that original slap echo that you would use. Did you guys use much of that? Did you have a lot of slap, like Elvis Memphis style sound Uh, like that in Motown? We didn't do that so much. The typical thing, at least I used it for, was delaying the feed to the chambers. Okay, tell us about that. What's the effect of that? Kind of the well, it it gives you the effect of the thing you're putting the echo on being closer to you. Because mm-hmm. the the echo happens a little bit later. Because the in echo time. happens a little bit later. Um, can you explain and describe a chamber to us and what and what they look like and how they were made there? I uh, can't. I picture Motown as a a garage. Yeah, no, it was never a garage. It was never a garage. It was a photo studio before it was a recording studio. Okay. And, in fact, something that was very cool about that was that it had a soft pine floor intended for spiking tripods and lights that turned out to sound freaking incredible. Soft pine. Yeah. So not the typical hardwood floor we're used to, but something that you would just... No, Put a dent some, in really it easily. was something you could easily nail something into. A lot of old photo studios had that kind of a floor. That was a real interesting common thing. And that turned out to work really well acoustically. And then the rest of the acoustic treatment was given to us by RCA because they were basically pressing more of our records than theirs for a few years. Wow. <laughs> so they just gave you all the rest of the sound treatment you might need for the studio. Yeah. So can you describe, well, l- let's not jump away from the chamber there for a sec. So okay. what, what is a chamber and what did it okay, look like? Okay, well, there? a chamber is a room with minimal parallel walls in it. And it is a very smooth finish. I think they were shellacking the walls at Motown. I later learned it was better to use the kind of cement they used for Teresa floors, but right. that's later. That was a Putnam <laughs> Okay, so it's a room that doesn't have the where the walls are not parallel. Where the walls are not parallel. Really hard surfaces. Really hard surfaces. And there's and, anything in the room? And it has a speaker in it and a microphone. Or, and that's it. Or maybe two microphones for stereo. So it's taking the sound, the echoey sound of your bathroom and just maximizing that as yeah. much as you can. Yeah. And how big? How big were the rooms there? Oh well the ones on the original location on Grand Boulevard were the, literally the attics of two houses. So you just take that attic space, and, and so they they finished it out and then put in the hard surfaces? Yeah. So almost like crawl space size. Uh, or a little, bigger than that. I think a little than bigger than that. I was not I was only up in there maybe once in seven years. So, <laughs> so but, can somebody take their spare bedroom and turn it into a chamber? Oh, you can turn anything. <laughs> I mean, right. a stairwell was very common in the New York studios. Yeah, really. And, I mean... You know, and that was really all you had. The only thing that was really as good was a, an EMT plate, which was a pretty expensive piece of gear. So it was a lot cheaper to build a an echo chamber. Wow, that's that's so cool. And the only, I mean, the only other thing is there were things that used a Hammond spring. There was a Fisher. In fact, I, I when I moved to San Francisco, I I got real sucked into home studios. Probably the biggest career mistake I ever made, but. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to touch, come back to that topic here in a sec, huh? Yeah. Well, no, the problem is you don't meet anybody in a home studio. Oh, right. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's one of the things that I think a lot of people face now is that lack of community yeah. uh, recording themselves at home. And Yeah. But any know. anyway, I set up a thing with two Fisher Spring units, and you'd feed mono to both of them and bring them up left and right. And that gave a pretty good stereo effect. Except it would give, go boing on you if you weren't careful. But if you high passed it, the feed, you could <laughs> high pass it. Which uh, a reminder that means cutting out all the lows. Yeah, yeah, if you cut the lows out feeding it, you could it you could make it work. And it, it, it was a, a not a half bad substitute 
Yeah. Well, so let me ask you about describing what it looked like at Motown. What? How do you describe the layout of the musicians and where things were placed and how they were recorded to get that sound? And then also, can you, before you even go, can you give us a couple of um, songs or, or recordings people might know from Motown? The studio was fairly small, although very well treated. The The RCA room treatment I mean, if you if you go back to what we were talking about, about the overall mic, the way RCA treated their studios was they wanted basically flat reflections off the walls. What does that mean, a flat reflection off the wall? In other words, flat frequency response. Okay. So so the, the, the reflections from the walls wouldn't have any particular coloration to them. So the lows echo back just as much as the highs echo back, as yeah. much as the mids. Yeah, Basically, it was a matter of absorbing the lows and not absorbing too much of the highs. Mm-hmm. How would they even do that stuff and figure that stuff out at that point? Oh, they, I mean, RCA had an unlimited budget. They That's fig- true. They I guess fi- we were flying to space only, you know, they a decade or so that later out. Anyway. They actually figured that out in the 40s. They had already tried dead studios in the 30s and found that didn't work for shit. <laughs> Not till the 70s, right? And so, no, no. So in the 1940s, well, it didn't work in the 70s either, but but the wheel was getting reinvented. (laughs) Oh, I mean, the 70s were one facepalm after another because you had enough tracks that you were going to be overdubbing. I mean, if the musicians weren't hearing each other acoustically, you might as well be overdubbing them. And so the old studios remain the most successful ones rather than the new dead ones. <laughs> because the mus- the musicians were playing better and the music was better coming out? Yeah. To me, the whole thing is keeping the whole thing out of the way of the musicians. Yeah, let's talk about that. I know that's really important to you. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> I mean, human beings make great music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the minute you start sticking technology in front, in front of them and between them, you're you're basically screwing up their ability to communicate with each other. And ultimately, that same sort of common thread that they communicate with is the thing that communicates with the listeners. I mean, it's real basic musical competence issues that get lost often. I mean, I've never understood why the hell anybody wants to sound like a Les Paul record. <laughs> and yet... Yet they seem to think that's the way to record. <laughs> that's funny. And at least my experience has been that, well, I have a given. It's like the musicians have got to be good enough to kick ass on stage or what's the point. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, building crutches for somebody who can't pull it off live is pointless to me because, I mean, especially today, the only place they're going to make any money is on stage. Yeah, really. In the current thing. So that really sorts it right there. So, okay, if they can kick ass live, if you can record them live with, you know, maybe a little bit of editing if something falls apart or something like that, that is going to be more exciting than anything you can possibly do with overdubs. And this idea of, of, oh, this is the way to do it. Well, no, actually... I mean, Sgt. Pepper's did not break the Beatles. What broke the Beatles were some mostly live recordings, or at least live tracks and vocals. Yeah. So by the time we got to Sgt. Pepper's, they had already. By the time made we their... got to Sgt. Pepper's, the Beatles could do anything. Yeah, everybody was already listening and and waiting to see what they would do. So yeah, and so you know they were kind of living out their fantasy, and and I did some of Stevie's first one man band recordings. But the unique thing about them is that that man is a walking musicologist, and he was not playing the best part for the song. He was acting out being the best person for the role. (laughs) That's awesome. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, Well, just that simple. I mean, he, he, he can mime any musician. He's utterly brilliant at it. And so it was a case of he would be the person, I mean, you know, he would evoke the person that he wanted to be playing on it, what he thought they would play. What 
prompted something like that? Was it just the fact that he had this ability to record it himself and well, so such and such star- drummer wasn't there, well, so he started, was going to make it sound it like that? It started actually with drummer. He had taken drum lessons from our main drummer, whose name was Benny Benjamin. And he was the guy who did all of the incredible shuffle feel stuff at Motown beginning in 1959 through 1966 or seven or somewhere in there. And I mean, he was this drummer with just incredible feel. And he was one of these guys who could hear everybody in the room and put it all together and make it all work. I mean, I was amazed. I When I started mixing, they gave me some TV tracks to do. And I discovered on half of them, if you took his drums out, it all fell apart. Yeah. <laughs> Completely blew my mind. <laughs> yes. I have seen, uh, you know, there, I don't think it's any secret that multi-tracks of some famous records are sort of float, have floated around the internet. And so I have seen one that was uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. I remember seeing that at some point and being able to, and and then I'm trying to remember if they did that in, Um, standing in the shadows of Motown, if they showed the individual tracks, but they did have the musicians together, but seeing the, the double drumming and what happens when you take one of them away. And I never even knew growing up that there were two drummers on. Well, that was a later thing. That was how they got around having Benny die. Oh, okay. All right. Wow. So yeah, he has hands Basically they put two drummers and Jack Ashford playing tambourine. Well, if you've ever played a gospel style tambourine, you know that you have to be totally relaxed. Yeah. It can't speed up or so it it is rock solid. I'm so glad that you brought up Jack Ashford because when I saw the movie uh, Standing in the Shadows of Motown, the thing that stuck with me as I left was Jack Ashford and his tambourine playing. And I went on a Google spree trying to find out everything I could about Jack Ashford and I couldn't find enough. But I thought... That was the magic of that sound, was that tambourine playing. And uh, can you tell us more about him and what that was all about? Well, he was one of our three percussionists. And they kind of figured out that the combination of the two drummers and him was solid as a rock. And that took them nearly a year to figure out. Luckily, they had enough stuff in the can that it there wasn't a huge drop in sales. But <laughs> they had about a year where none of the new stuff was and that was that great. That was after uh, Benny died. After Benny it? died, yeah. Wow. So I didn't know that story that there was that, you know, uh, slump there. Or yeah. There was so that, there, there was that um, scrambling to try and figure out. Yeah, there was some scrambling, work. and that combination came out of it. But everybody had to really up their game. Interesting for it to all work. Whereas That's they had been able to get away with a lot of slop with Benny, and he would just. There's a, there's a couple guys here in Nashville who have that same ability. One is Dave Hungate, and another is Reggie Young. That ability, like Benny did, to kind of make stuff work. Yeah, yeah. Wow, fascinating. <laughs> I mean, it's it's mind boggling when you, when, I, I mean, once you start to realize it, it's like holy cow, what these guys could do. Now, a thing to understand is you can't really do that overdubbing. Because it's an interaction. Yes. It's it's how the people respond to each other. Now did they let me let me pause you. Did you did they have headphones on while they were recording? And was your only mix part only, of what they were hearing? Only the drummers. Only the drummers, all right. Only the drummers. The guitar players and the bass were all going into a mixer that split off in direct off into the control room patch bay. And then they had a little mixer that they could get a balance among themselves. And then that went to a 60-watt Macintosh power amp and an Altex studio monitor that was under it. And that was our guitar amp. The, yeah, right. That was that was one of those Altec mixers or something like that that would... Well, the mixer was homemade. But there was we were talking about plugging the, speaker, the electric and the bass all the, into this mixer. But they're all, they're all going into the same mixer direct... They're all hearing each other. Everybody in the room is hearing all of them coming out of the one speaker. And so they were bl- getting their own blend of sound together through that one speaker. Yeah. Wow, what a trip. That's bass and electric guitars. Yeah. 
And then and that was somehow the speaker was mic'd up or it was somehow sending a direct signal over it the It was tape. all direct. That's amazing. It was all direct. And it turned out, I figured it out after I moved here. I moved here because Bob Babbitt was here, who was one of our bass players. Yeah. He, I mean, the first words out of his mouth when we met again was, how in the hell did you guys get that bass sound? Well, the truth is we didn't do anything. It was his fingers. Yeah. But the deal was he was hearing it on a studio monitor and not on a bass amp. So he was dialing it in so it sounded right, the way it would end up on tape. Yeah. And so he was adjusting it to how it would sound on tape with his fingers unconsciously. I have to say that despite the uh, overdub process not being the same, I have noticed that it can be so much easier to get a fantastic bass tone a lot of times overdubbing in the control room and hearing the bass in the in the monitors and you know blending oh, yeah. with the track and the drums and everything. Oh yeah. Where, I did some of the best guitar overdubs with Quicksilver on, <laughs> on a pair of JBL 4311s that we blew up several times. <laughs> but I had a uh we discovered that a Nady wireless from the guitar to the amp down in the studio was the cleanest thing. Really? It was better than a wire. Oh, this is when you were at Quicksilver? This yeah. is in the, the Yeah, 80s our, stu our studio was upstairs overlooking okay. the performing room. Oh, wow, that's interesting. And well, I, that was an anal analog wireless. So it was a radio signal, as opposed to today's, which would probably be a digital box yeah, of some yeah, sort anyway. Yeah, this was, the, this was the first wireless guitar mic thing. Uh, actually, it, it originally belonged to... Starship, and we we got the hand me downs from the dead in the Starship. Oh man, we got to <laughs> jump forward to that. So before we jump forward a decade here, um, can you, from where you s were in the uh, control room at Motown, can you describe what you saw through the glass where the musicians were placed? And okay, well the piano was along the left wall. It was a Steinway D nine foot nine foot. Wow. It was not in very good condition. I laughed my ass off when I heard Paul McCartney had paid to rebuild it. Because oh, no. <laughs> it's undoubtedly 90 times better than anything we had with it. <laughs> and, and it had a, it was very sensitive to the touch of the player. And I used to be frustrated as hell about the piano sound I could get from it. Until one day, Valerie Simpson walked over to show a little part she wanted the piano player to play. And all of a sudden, I heard the best piano sound I'd ever heard in my life. Because it was the player, once again? It turned out it was the player. It was like, oh, God. I've heard that kind of story so many times. So, yeah, that was one of those aha moments. I've, I've had a number of aha moments like that where I kind of realized that Engineering is hell plus <laughs> relative. To Do you want to share any more aha moments touch. about that? Because I love hearing about that stuff. Well, bringing Babbitt over here and having him play bass flat through just the monitors <laughs> sounded better. Than and there the was the old really Motown had. sound again. Yeah. yeah really. <laughs> and, which he <laughs> blew his mind. <laughs> it would be so close. That's cool, man. And, uh, oh, God, what? Well, after I got here, Reggie Young uh, discovered you that anything signal processing-wise you did to his guitar screwed it up. Really? <laughs> oh, well, what's hilarious is how I got turned on to Reggie Young was in Miami. I spent about an hour with Tom Dowd. I was telling him about how Babbitt and Ed Green were here in Nashville. And Babbitt and Ed Green were Tom Bell's A-team bass and drums. <laughs> I mean, most serious R&B drum combination on the planet. Hmm. And these two guys were here, and they weren't hardly doing anything. Babbitt had been on the road with country pop star Anyway, he'd been on the road with this woman for 10 years, and Green had come out because Babbitt was here. Green had played all the Barry White records. He had, I mean, 
was ridiculous what he, all he had done. Wow. So anyway, I'm telling Tom Dowd about this. And he looks me in the eye and he says, well, Jesus Christ, get him together with Reggie Young. He's the greatest accompanist of the 20th century. So I thought, okay, well, we'll check that out. Well, so I talked to Babbitt. Babbitt says, yeah, sure, he'll play with us. I didn't even know who the hell he was. <laughs> and finally, I'd been doing some recording, and we were going to do do some guitar overdubs at my friend's apartment around the corner. And so I knew somebody or other who had Reggie's number, so we called him. And he came over and checked it out and got this huge grin. It's like his his because it, it was it was blatantly obvious that the musician was more important to us than the gear, right? <laughs> and and uh, the night before that, I had done some searching on the internet and I figured out who the hell the guy was, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, and that's how you learned about Reggie, too. And that's how I began to learn about Reggie, and then I've picked up bits and pieces. But anyway. Well, it's been like that for me, you know, my experience here in Nashville, just working on stuff, and I get introduced to somebody, and at first maybe I just notice that they're great, and and then later I I learn more about them, and I can't believe the discography. I mean, I've known you for a while, Bob, and, and, you know, learning more about you just here on this interview is a stunning (laughs) amount of stuff. Well, let let me ask you this question. So... One of the things I know, it sounds like when you left Motown, you know, you had a choice to go to follow them to Los Angeles, but you were sort of more interested in rock and roll and what was going on yeah. with the new sound, right? I was interested in San Francisco because it looked for all the world. I mean, everybody I knew in L.A. was dying to move to San Francisco, and it looked for all the world like the music business was going to move up there from L.A., and I had a shot at a job at Wally Hyder's. Well, I'd also had an offer from England, wound up not working out. But, yeah. But so, you ended up in San Francisco. I mean, you work with some But I ended amazing- up in, in San Francisco. At first, I, the drug scene completely freaked me out. Yeah, really. This is a, this is the time of the Grateful Dead and Haight Ashbury and and this well, this Hendrix is nineteen seventy two. So it was after a little, a little after that, all right. After that, but when a lot of people were into cocaine and and the nature of musicians on cocaine is they don't get anything done in the studio and then the next day when they realize they haven't come up with something they're looking for somebody to blame right exactly <laughs> and, no fun and i yeah that really turned me off and so that was when i went over to the radio station and volunteered and got involved in doing the recording and it was live to two track two track ampex and i think it was so this is once again you're you're three or four ampex mixers in a rack that's great and that's what we had to work with and then i i had bought some mics in detroit because at motown we only had all neumann km86s for everything and i knew that motown was going to be leaving I knew that there, I mean, basically what else was in the music business in Detroit had already left. All of New York had left for L.A. (laughs) Yeah. Most of London had moved to L.A. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum 
drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. So I'm here with Bob Olson on Recording Studio Rockstars. Bob, thanks so much for joining us. And we're going to jump into the jam session here for a minute. You ready to jam, Bob? Okay. (laughs) All right, cool, man. Uh, So, Bob, tell us, when you were starting out, what was one of the things that was holding you back? Confidence. Like everybody. Yeah, just being, just fear and confidence. Fear and confidence. Yeah, it's so common. It's so true. How about some of the best advice that you received initially or anywhere along the way? Probably keep the session moving. And what does that mean, keep the session and moving? That basically, it means don't let the musicians get bored. Yeah. <laughs> don't let them lose their excitement about playing yeah, some music. Yeah, don't let them. Yeah, and that came from one of my main teachers who was Cal Harris who had come from Gold Star, who had started at United Western. <laughs> nice. God. And I only figured that out years later. <laughs> well, all right. So how about sharing with us a, uh, a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that would really help people out in making records? Avoid headphones. Okay. <laughs> so and uh, when you say avoid headphones, you're talking about I mean, if you're overdubbing, set up a speaker, set up the microphone. How do you do that? I don't. I think most people wouldn't wouldn't understand how that would work. This is how everything was done prior to about 1965. Well, first off, you had a good speaker system in the studio because the control rooms were so small, you couldn't get, and you were recording a whole band, you know, ten or fifteen people at once, so you couldn't get everybody in the control room. So you weren't going to do playbacks in the control room. Right. So you had to have good quality playback system in the studio. And so to overdub, all you would do is you would play the track back out in the studio and have a cardioid mic facing the singer, facing away from the speaker. Wow. And the the bleed would not be an issue or enough of an issue? People go to extraordinary lengths with delays to duplicate the sound of the bleed. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. I mean, it's... Well, the, I mean, the good the one difference is that back then you were committed to three tracks or four tracks or eight tracks. Yeah. So you weren't going to, there was not much risk of playing something that was then going to get taken out of the mix. Right. So there wasn't bleed of something that no longer existed. So, in the if, song. so if you're going to overdub, you would probably want to have the locked in stuff like just the bass and drums and. You know, any, any, you probably wouldn't want to have solos in it and wouldn't want yeah. to have. Now, what about click tracks? Did you guys actually use click tracks back we, then? We never used click tracks before. I, I worked with one guy named Dean Taylor who wanted to do all overdubs and wanted to use a click track. We quickly discovered the only way we could make a click track work was cutting a tape loop. Oh, really? Metronomes weren't accurate enough. Wow. <laughs> Wow, interesting. <laughs> or you know, or you could just get uh, one of your great drummers in there. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right. So now, Bob, tell us about a favorite hardware tool for the studio. Something that, when you're doing sessions, you're always glad you've got it. Well, the first piece of outboard gear I ever bought in my life was a URI LA three A. I saw that in another studio. It blew my mind. I bought one and started hauling it in to Motown. And it's a combination compressor and limiter. It has a compression switch, a switch between compression and limiting, but it's optical. And the early ones, I mean, it's actually sitting on the floor right behind you. The same one. (laughs) Yeah. Right on. It was one of the first 120, I think, or something. I mean, it was real early on. Wow. And it just sounded so much better than anything else we had. I mean, one thing a lot of people crack a lot of people up is that is that we did not like the Fairchild 660s and 670s. Yeah. The way we used them at Motown was parallel compression. Yeah. 
Do you want to tell us a little bit about doing parallel compression at Motown? Yeah, well, we had a, <laughs> what I love to call a man's patch bay. So everything came up on the patch bay. And oh, it was all double plugs, so you could reverse the plug to flip the phase. And <laughs> Oh, nice. It was wonderful. So you basically come out of that. We didn't have half normaling, so you had to go out of that into a malt panel, which was basically a bunch of jacks that were wired together. Mm -hmm. So you'd come out of the mic preamp into the malt panel, and then out of the malt panel, send one to one fader, send the other to the compressor, and then patch that to the other fader, and then mix the two together. I like it because the cool part about it is that you could kind of get anything anywhere. Oh, yeah. You weren't stuck with... No, you weren't stuck with anything, and you could ride both faders to work on it, and they were very... How did you come up with this parallel compression idea? What made you think the that that was something The idea originally came from... Somebody who knew something about Deutsch gramophone that they were doing it on classical recordings. Is it is it almost the concept that the original signal has got all the dynamic that you want? Yeah. But the parallel compression just kind of brings up the low stuff to make it a little louder. To make it a little you know, louder for, for and whatever you're limited. Less of a tape tape hiss problem. Yeah. Because that was what it was about back then was fighting tape hiss. I mean the Beatles. I I went to Heavy Road in 1969 and and they had. They just put in this TG console of a compressor on every channel, which totally blew my mind. And they had compressors all over the place. And I asked about it. And to a person, they said, well, we hate the sound of compression, but we hate the sound of tape hiss more. And we can't wait until we get an 8-track. Wow. <laughs> and the 8-track, why the 8-track? How would that affect the tape hiss? Because that meant you weren't going to have to go as many tape generations. Oh, well, I see. Right. So you're not adding the tape hiss to it. So, so you're not. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, so. But we Motown had been eight tracks since 64. Okay. Yeah. You're saying, and I know that um, I think Fame was doing eight tracks too at that point or something. Nope. No, only, no, no. At, only Atlantic and they weren't doing, they were running as a backup. Okay. All right. Which I started to get into the three track. Back then, I mean, tape generations were considered a no-no. So if you were doing a live recording, they would typically be mixing it to mono. The mono mix was God, first generation. That was what was important. Stereo yeah. was like 5-1 is today. Right, exactly. Right. What is that? <laughs> and the three track was a backup where you had stereo and you had a separate vocal and soloist track and the other than for doing stereo, the reason they had that was so that if the person doing the recording missed something writing the vocal, they could go back and round into a remix of a different write on the vocal. And at Atlantic, they started recording eight track, again, mixing everything to mono. But because they knew stereo was coming, they figured it was a way that they would have stereo for their catalog when that finally all got developed. That's a trip, man. But they weren't overdubbing. Well, so, uh, you know, the, there's so much amazing old analog gear and old methodology, and yet so many of us are faced with a computer and a laptop and figuring out how to do things with, you know, an interface. What are some of the, your favorite software tools for making records these days? Because I know even you are using digital all the time. Right? Uh, well, what I use, I use Pro Tools for... Recording and mixing, and I use Samplitude for mastering. And I use Samplitude because it lets you set up a processing chain in each song file or section of a song file. And so that's just very convenient for recalls and all of that. And it's less dodgy than putting each song on a separate track. And Sure. Have you found any favorite plugins as far as maybe stuff that emulates Older I, sounds that, but that you it's totally of? bizarre. It's like, I mean, plugins are like a like a drawing of an old piece of gear, and some of them work fantastically with one source, and then just absolutely suck on another source. Yeah. So they're they're less foolproof, way less foolproof than the analog gear. 
Of course, by your own admission, so did the Fairchild 670, right? Well, 670 just sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only reason it was in a studio, it originally bought them for mastering rooms because the vertical lateral, you know, yeah. MS thing sounded like a good idea. But then they discovered that when you switched the thing over to MS, just went to hell. And so you couldn't really use an MS. And at that point, you were doing separate stereo. And at that point, you might better be using two better sounding compressors if you're assuming you're doing compression, which actually was not nearly as common as it became after VSSL boards came in. Wow. Well, so Bob, I've only got a few more quick questions for you. Can you give us any insights or tips for people for just the business side of doing recording? Some people are doing this as a hobby, but but others okay. listening are, well, want to do this for a living. A couple basic things to understand. First off, the only thing that you have to sell is your audience. It's not about selling the music. The music is what you do for the audience, but from a financial standpoint, the ears are what is for sale. You're selling it to promoters. You're selling it to radio. You're selling it to Apple to sell files to, it's, you know, so Mm -hmm. it's like, you got to understand that, that the relationship with the audience is everything. So you mean as in, let's say you're an engineer or producer, you have your own audience or the audience is who's going to listen to the record? The audience is, well, you have the audience who's going to listen to the record, but you're actually doing the production and the mastering for the reviewers and the people who will spread the word about the artist. Yeah. I mean, so th- if, I mean, if you get them drawn in, you get the chain reaction that's a hit record. Yeah, really, really. So it's great advice. So you have to, you have to look at it that way. And do, the, do you hear that, rock stars? This is all about you. But, all about you. But the other thing to understand is that the artist is a brand. A label, interestingly, is not a brand. <laughs> the artist is a brand. Yeah. Absolutely, the artist who has it figured out the best of anybody I've ever seen is Jimmy Buffett. Mm -hmm. Go check out his website. Go, I mean, this guy literally took it all on himself, set up his own label, set up his own everything after his major label contract expired, hid how successful he was. And nobody knew until all of a sudden Garth Brooks bumbled into his fan base. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and went up to the top. Interesting. Buffett may well be the biggest selling artist of all time, but he isn't talking about it. Wow. Fascinating. <laughs> so his low key attitudes towards everything would run with, sort of with, anathema to with his a success. Absolutely incredible focus on the fans. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It, the the parrot heads. It is about the fans. Well, I know we didn't get to talk about it, but uh, another band that you worked with that was all about their fans would be the Grateful Dead, right? Oh, they were an incredible lesson in about, they had the most effective fan club in history. Did you see a lot of Dead shows? Or were you in the studio the whole time? Not very many. I worked on the, I mean, I they they would come around every now and then because they had, they had, co-headlined shows with Quicksilver for years. I see. And, I mean, they were both really jam bands. Quicksilver jammed on on Bo Diddley much of the time. Interesting. Wow. (laughs) Consciously. (laughs) Well, all right, Bob. So here's a a bit of a bizarre uh, hypothetical question. And this maybe is for advice to somebody who's finding themselves in this boat right now. Uh, Once upon a time... You were brand new and you were in a new place trying to figure out what to do. Uh, But let's say hypothetically you, I don't know if you're about to do that again, maybe at this stage of life, but uh, maybe advice to somebody who is, you know, if you had to start over somewhere, go to a new city and just, and start over and record and you needed some kind of simple setup to record people, you needed to meet musicians and people to record and make music with, and then you just needed to make ends meet so that you could build your recording career. What advice would you give someone? I have no idea. <laughs> because, right. I mean, I bumbled into it when I was 16. And, you know, I mean, I'm basically the guy like Ken Scott who started at the top. <laughs> I didn't have anywhere near the career he had. But, <laughs> but you know, it's been trying to figure out what the hell was going on there. It's been the whole rest of my life. 
Wow. <laughs> well, that I like your and honesty I, you in know, that I answer mean, too. You're actually the first person to just say, I don't know. But you know, I noticed that you are adopting some a lot of you I mean you've always adopted new technologies oh. pro tools when it came along Oh I've been on the you, bleeding you, edge all my life Yeah you talk about I'm um, doing music with your wife where you set up a streaming yeah, channel for you and you talk about the importance of audience and maybe that's maybe those are the that's, elements That's I mean audience is really the whole thing you need look no farther than Adele <laughs> to see that in many ways it hasn't changed a damn bit except that there's an awful lot of really dumbed down music out there yeah. that doesn't have the kind of human interaction that communicates emotion. And I mean, I think some kid is going to get on stage and pull a Beatles again. I mean, just pull a rug from under everybody with a live show that really connects and that people really get. And I, I, I mean, I already watched the Beatles blindside the industry, and I know, I mean, the, the guy who was the head of A&R at Capital told me that they happen in spite of Capital. Interesting. <laughs> so maybe your advice to somebody is, you know, the importance of live and, and just getting back to the emotional heart of music live. is just be, get, all, get as close and, to that as you can. Yeah, and, and something a guy told me that makes perfect sense is always fill the house. So however many people you can draw, find a house of that size. Better to have a full living room awesome. connecting with people. Awesome. I love that advice. Than to That's be great. in a, a club that holds 50 people and there's only 10. That's great. All right, Bob, here's the, here's the, uh, the final question and okay. the tough one. And I take it or leave it. But what advice would you have for our listeners, the single most important thing that they could do to become a rock star of the recording studio? Oh, always be the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> nice. I like that. <laughs> Can I raise my hand right now in this room? Oh, that's, I mean. So what does that mean? Uh, that means somehow go find people who are really talented and find a way to work with them. I mean, for example, recording schools. If you're going to go to a recording school, go to a music school where you're going to get to know musicians who are going places. Yeah. Because basically you get a job in a studio, a, a friend of a client is the only thing better than a friend of the boss yeah. <laughs> for getting a job. Yeah. Well, they talk about the idea of each of us being uh, uh, an average of the five people that we spend our most time with, you know, the influence, the power of influence of who you surround yourself with. Yeah. I mean, that's, Really, I mean, I have to admit, I bumbled into it totally. I mean, those two women from NBC, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, those were, it was the uh, the drama instructors that were able to get you to um, Well, to Motown. understand the basics. Yeah. And then when I got to Motown, they got that I understood the basics. I'd also been hanging out in a studio and actually first, release record I was ever involved with was a remote of James Cleveland for chess. Wow. Chess the, records. Where yeah. the producer brought a four track in the back of his Cadillac, drove into Detroit from Chicago, and we had a couple Sony mixers and some mics. That's so cool. I love that stuff. And, and recorded it. And musically that blew my mind. I mean, completely, totally I had no idea there was anything like that in the world at all. That that one did me in. And then the next one that did me in was a James Brown concert. And the next one that did me in was a living room concert of a 17 or 18-year-old girl from India with a tambura behind her. That's wild. And well, she levitated the room exactly like James Cleveland had. <laughs> and I instantly realized all the Indian music I'd heard was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Which I later confirmed with a friend of mine from India. That's funny. He That's said, funny. "He said, yeah, nobody any good is going to come to the U.S." That's funny. He said, "There's too much money to be made in India." Wow, if that's good. fascinating. <laughs> well, Bob, thank you so anyway, much. Thank yeah. you. We're just we're just ridiculously well, you're, you're honored to join us on on recording studio rock stars. How can listeners find out more about you? Find you? How can they reach you if they want to send you a thank you? Email okay. or whatever. Well, I I actually have a thing, a website, 
audiomastery.com, believe it or not, we grabbed. And there is also a bobolson.com, although it, it was intended to try and pitch me to do lectures in Europe. That I noticed that one was full of brilliant quotes. Didn't wind up happening, but that that's a collection of quotes. Oh, the bizarre thing is that my quotes... I mean, what happens is I see something on the internet that I disagree with, and that's what generates those quotes. Yeah. <laughs> well, great stuff, Bob. Thank you so much. Really been a pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you around the studio here in town. Yeah. Cheers, man. Likewise. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.